All right, let's continue to discuss factors that influence why people help others. But this time, let's focus on motivational factors. In general, they're pretty straightforward. I mentioned in a previous lecture that our motivations for helping are multiply determined. So in other words, there can be several reasons that explain why one person might help another. For now, let's focus on egoistic motives, which are based purely on one's self-interest. When our motivations are egoistic, we help others to help ourselves. In fact, you'll probably agree once we start talking about this that it's probably true that most pro-social behavior is at least partially selfish. And although it sounds horrible, the decision of whether or not to help may actually start with a quick cost-benefit analysis. When the rewards outweigh the costs, we're likely to help people. But when the costs are high, we might end up being unresponsive to other people's needs. So if one motivation for helping is selfish, how can helping people help ourselves? Well, we can gain various rewards for helping. Some of them are tangible, like monetary payments, and some of them are psychological, like mood enhancement. Helping others can make us feel better. Mood enhancement is actually closely related to what Robert Cialdini called negative state relief. When we're feeling down, that is when we're in a negative state, helping can bring relief. It can make us feel better again. Other rewards can include reciprocity credits, which means if I help you, now you owe me. Of course, helping can also wind up with us feeling honored. We can be praised. We can have an increase in our self-esteem. And some people, based on their religious beliefs, might think that helpful people are rewarded with a place in heaven. So there clearly are rewards for helping, but helping can also allow people to avoid various costs. So for example, this is pretty interesting. Some areas have enacted what they call duty to rescue laws that require people to help or at least call for help in an emergency. And people who fail to do that risk having fines levied against them or even jail time. And of course, failing to help can bring shame or guilt. And depending on one's religious beliefs, failing to help can land you in hell. What I find really interesting is the idea of empathy costs. You know, many of us hurt when other people are hurting. We literally feel their pain, at least psychologically. Well, helping people relieve their suffering ensures that we won't be suffering either. Another particularly interesting cost comes from when someone needs to provide sustained, ongoing help in the face of potentially enormous costs. This is often known as courageous resistance. People in these situations often decide to help others who are typically family members with like long-term care, maybe due to a disability or a disease. And it's really tough because the, the physical, the mental, and the financial costs associated with that type of long-term care for sick and disabled people can be devastating. And the care involved can be exhausting. And that typically takes a toll on the helper's mental and physical health. So courageous resistance is really about providing care, providing help, even in the face of adversity. And that's really one reason why some people decide not to help someone who clearly needs help. Remember, I mentioned that people engage in at least some type of informal cost-benefit analysis, and sometimes the costs are simply too high. That's sad, but it's true. All right, now in contrast to egoistic motives, Altruistic motives are based purely on one's desire to improve another person's welfare. So unlike egoistic motives, altruistic motives are not selfish. They're not self-based. The motivation to help people is based completely on one's desire to help someone, you know, without any benefits expected in return. Altruism is associated with compassion and sympathy. Sympathy is understanding how another person feels. And it's also associated, probably most importantly for our discussion today, with empathy. Empathy involves taking the perspective of another person and actually feeling what they're feeling. Empathy is kind of like living in another person's skin for a while and truly experiencing their emotions and their distress that they're experiencing. According to Dan Batson's empathy altruism hypothesis, perspective taking and then the feelings of empathy that follow are key factors in determining whether some pro-social behavior is fundamentally altruistic in nature, which is non-selfish, or egoistic in nature, which to some extent is selfish. 
Let's go through a few examples, and I think at the end of that, you'll better understand what I mean. This flow chart is going to help us better understand the empathy altruism hypothesis, and specifically the role of empathy in distinguishing between an altruistic motive or an egoistic motive. Let's use as an example, driving down the road and you see a dog who's abandoned or you know just doesn't know where its home is and it's clearly cold, it's shivering, it's, it's hungry. Let's assume first that my wife sees this dog at the side of the road. So the first thing that needs to happen if a person is going to provide help is that that person needs to recognize that someone or something in this case needs help. And if my wife saw a dog at the side of the road, she's absolutely going to think that this dog needs some help. But here's the key thing. We need to determine if that person, my wife in this case, is going to adopt this dog's perspective. In other words, is she going to be able to feel what this dog is feeling? I know it sounds a little bit strange because we're talking about a dog, but I'll tell you absolutely yes. She is going to put herself in that dog's place and she's going to feel that it's cold and uncomfortable and scared. Well, her emotional response in this case is known as empathic concern. So she's feeling what the dog is feeling, and she's ultimately concerned for that dog. Not about herself, she's concerned about the dog. Well, she's going to decide to help. She's going to pull over, and she's going to let the dog in the car, and she's going to find out who the owner is, or take the dog to the pound, do whatever she needs to do. That type of motive in that case is altruistic, because what she's really trying to do is reduce the dog's distress, not her own. Now, let's go through that same type of situation with me. Now, I'm an animal lover too, but let's just assume in this case, I don't love animals quite as much as my wife. So again, I'm going to see the dog at the side of the road. I'm going to know that it needs help. So I perceived that there's some type of help that is necessary. But here's the critical question again. Do I adopt that dog's perspective? Am I going to actually feel its pain? Well, let's say I don't. I see it's at the side of the road and that it's cold, but okay, it's a, it's a cold dog. At this particular point, I'm going to realize that if I don't pull over and help that dog, my wife is never going to let me live that down. And not only that, well, I feel her shame that she's putting upon me. I'm going to feel some distress as well because I don't want to see a dog at the side of the road that's cold. So I'm just feeling that I should do something. I'm obligated to do something. And I'm going to do something. I'm going to pull over. I'm going to help the dog out. I'm going to help find its owners or take it to the pound, something like that, just like my wife did. But in this case, the motive is egoistic. I'm going to help that dog to help myself out because I want to reduce my own distress. I want to feel better about myself. I want my wife to be proud of me. So what's really interesting about this example is the behavior in the end from me and from my wife, they're both the exact same behaviors. We're both going to help the dog, but the motives in those two situations are different. In my wife's case, it's an altruistic motive. In my case, it's an egoistic motive. So long story short, you can see it can be difficult to distinguish between motives that are altruistic in nature and egoistic in nature. And thus, there's a, a big debate in social psychology. Some people think that altruism does indeed exist, and some people think it does not, and that all pro-social behavior, to some extent, is egoistic, and people are acting because of rewards. It's not hard to see why some people might think that, and that's because rewards are almost always present. Check out this study right here. People were randomly assigned to one of two groups. They were all given some money to spend. Some people were randomly assigned to spend that money on themselves, you know, which is something that usually feels pretty good. But then the other people were randomly assigned to spend that money on others, and that feels good too. Later on, when people were measured in terms of their mood, the people who spent the money pro-socially on other people felt better. So that suggests that these people are rewarded by helping others. Because there's always some type of reward in helping others, it's easy to see that helping behavior can be labeled as egoistic in many situations. All right, well, that said, some researchers have used some clever techniques to try to test the empathy altruism model to determine if there might be some evidence that altruism does truly exist. So in this particular situation, 
where searchers uh, randomly assigned subjects to a couple different groups. In one group, they read about a girl who lost her family in a car accident. So she clearly needed help. And one thing they were talking about in the scenario is that she needed help with um, transportation, like rides to school. Well, people in the low empathy condition were told to just remain objective, just read the facts, try not to you know, get your emotions involved. And then some of the people were also told that you know, we're going to engage in some memory techniques. So you're likely to really remember this scenario later on. And some people were told that we're going to be using some memory techniques. So you're likely to forget all about this situation. The question was, how many of the people would actually say, yes, I'm willing to help this person later on? So we're looking at the proportion of people who decided they would help. Well, people who were told that they were likely to remember this situation later on, they were more likely to help. But what I really want to draw your attention to is these people right here. If they were told that they would likely forget about this situation later on, they're like, fine. You know, I'm not feeling what this girl is feeling. I'm going to forget about this later on. I'm not going to help out. And very few people actually helped. So this pattern of responding seems egoistic in nature. Now compare that to this situation. In this particular situation, there was a manipulation so that it encouraged high empathy because people were told to read about this girl and then imagine how she feels. Imagine what she must be going through. Now again, some of the people were told that they were going to be using some memory techniques where they'd quickly forget about this later on. And other people were told that they'd be using memory techniques where it was likely that they would remember this for a long time. But in this situation, you can see when high empathy was aroused, it didn't matter if people were going to forget this situation or remember a high proportion of these people were willing to help. So this suggests an altruistic motive. All right, well, let's wrap up this video with a little bit more good news. Regardless of the motivation, there's some evidence based on some new research that helping is really our default inclination. And the way that this was tested was by forcing people to act very quickly. When you act very quickly, you don't really have too much time to think. So we can figure out what is your default, your everyday inclination for how you would react. And when forced to act quickly, people were more likely to help other people and to act cooperatively. But, and this is where it gets kind of interesting, when we have more time to think, we're more likely to weigh the costs and the benefits of helping and then less likely to provide help overall. So thinking is usually a good thing, but maybe not always in these situations. So here's my advice. Quit thinking so much. Just help people. It'll make the world a better place. Well, that's it for this section, but stay tuned because there's more social psychology coming up soon. <laughs>